It's very good to see so many of you here. Um, we have a really very interesting panel on a topic which is live and difficult and contentious. And I have some excellent colleagues to speak at that conference on that topic. Just before I get into the detail, I've been asked to remind you that given you've already had such a good day today, you would be delighted to know about our annual conference on the 19th of June, um, which is always uh, magnificent, um, and you should clear your diaries to attend it. Uh, the Nick, so going back to this conference, uh, I want to just briefly introduce my guests. You will have seen their CVs. I don't want to take up a lot of time um, giving them uh, lots and lots of plaudits. You all know they're fantastic. On my right is Henry Hill for cons from Conservative Home. On my left is Michaela Benson um, from University of Lancaster. And a bit further to my left is uh, Sunder Katwala from British Futures. And we are talking today about asylum and humanitarian protection. What is asylum and what is humanitarian protection, Michaela? Yeah, so um, asylum generally refers to the international protections that were established through the UN Convention for Human Rights um, and the UN Convention for um, Refugees, the 1951 Convention. And it's an obligation that countries who are signatories to that have to allow people to claim asylum in their countries. Humanitarian protections, as we've seen them roll out, particularly over the last few years in the UK, are a slightly different system to that. And some kind of headline schemes that you may have heard about that fall into what the UK is calling safe and legal routes, which are their system of humanitarian protections, are the Afghan resettlement, the, the Afghan resettlement scheme, and the Hong Kong BNO visa scheme, and the Ukraine visa schemes. Now, where these differ from the international protections that are offered are that they are domestic provisions that the UK government has designed themselves to allow people from particular nationalities to move to and settle for the greater or, long, or shorter periods of time in the UK because the UK has deemed that what is happening in the places of origin of those people um, demands a response, a nationality-specific response. But... Notably, when we have a look at those schemes, we can see that there's no equivalence between the schemes as you would find under refugee protections. So each of the schemes comes with different sets of rights. In the case of the Hong Kongers, for example, this is a paid for protection. So they're the only scheme where people have to pay for the humanitarian protections they receive from the British state. Um, but we also find that there are differences around um, the, the routes to settlement people are permitted, as well as access to things like healthcare, education, all kinds of things. So I think what we're seeing in the way that these schemes have been mobilised in the last few years is a contrast between the international system, the asylum system, that was a form of multilateral protection, and we've moved towards a system in the UK where they're kind of championing, I would say, a unilateral approach. So thank you, that's really very helpful. Just on the question of asylum, is it the case that you've got to claim asylum in the first safe country you've got to? Are you asking me again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that is generally what is understood, and that's what has been behind a lot of the returns policies, agreements. Um, but I don't think that you have to do that. Okay. Thank you. And what about numbers? OK, so when we're talking about asylum, in terms of the overall numbers of people who come to the UK, we think it's around 6% of the overall numbers of people who come. When we're talking about humanitarian protections, just to put it in the context of some of the discussions that have been going on around net migration and gross migration today, um, since their launch, the Hong Kong BNO and the Ukraine visa schemes have accounted for at least 355,000 people arriving in the UK. And that's, so the Hong Kong BNO visa scheme was the first one to be announced after the Brexit transition period. It launched on the 31st of January 2021. Um, so you can see this is in a very, very short period of time. And if I could just link back to some of the things that were said in the previous session, what was absolutely extraordinary about this scheme when it, went, when it was proposed in the Houses of Parliament was with perhaps only one exception, there was cross-party, cross-house support for that scheme. 
Thank you. That's immensely helpful. So we've got an idea of the, of the numbers. So we say asylum's about 6%. So if we'd come and have a think about the small boats, where does the small boats fit into all of this picture? Well, the small boats are very, very important because, that, you know, there could be different debates about, you know, we saw a broad, you know, warming and calming down of attitudes towards immigration generally. And we've seen a slight hardening of that, as this report shows. And there would be two or three reasons that might have been the case. One would be, well, the overall numbers are very high or the asylum numbers are very high. And another would be, no, it's the visibility of the lack of control of small boats. And I think there's a very strong case that it's primarily the visibility of the lack of control of boats and what that means about borders and about your imagery and sovereignty and so on, that it, that is more important. And therefore, you know, a, a, a high latent consensus, but very unknown policy in a way, the Hong Kong policy, which is large, or the Ukrainian policy, which was popular and visible, much, much larger than the boats, but they are, but they are, but they are choices. So the question of, you know, you know what is a, an effective and sustainable system what is effective you know are you processing well has it all gone wrong domestically internationally is there cooperation or isn't there cooperation but also a sustainable system is about public confidence and consent for the system you've got and i think there's no doubt that the visibility of small boats and people say if you ask them directly um you know how do most Migrants get here. You have had a question. You know, do most people come legally or illegally? A slight majority say more people come illegally than legally, i.e. the 4% the or the 6% is thought to be bigger than the 94%. And so with the, the, those coming on small boats, how many of them go on to claim asylum? It's, it's, it's almost all of the people. And, there, you know, there are sometimes... You know, an Albanian group came in and was dealt with, and there's been a rush of Vietnamese. But it's almost it's almost 99% of people who come on boats putting in a claim. And then, you know, there are different now policies and systems as to the government's, <coughs> in principle, the government wishes now to refuse all of the claims that have come in this way, um, having previously said it might regard people as inadmissible, but will then admit them if it hasn't got a plan. Its policy now is to not admit them even if it hasn't got a plan until its plan emerges as to where they might go. But that nevertheless, the small boats are coming. And so what happens to those people? Well, that, that is now, that is now the, 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 the difficult situation for the current government or for you know, itself if we're elected or, or the next government. So, for example, the government wants to have its Rwanda scheme. And it hasn't happened, and it would say, well, if we're re-elected, it will happen. They've got 6,000 people on a list earmarked for Rwanda. The Rwandan scheme probably isn't ever going to take 6,000 people, but it might take 500 people. In reality, it might take nobody ever. All of the 6,000 people arrived before June 2023. There are then another 60,000 people who arrived since June 23, and the policy is if they, they've passed into law, the Home Secretary should refuse those people forever. And they haven't triggered that yet. Um, so in principle, the policy is that none of those people will ever be admitted, but they're not even on the Rwanda list. And then there were another 11,000 people this year. There is almost certainly no either practical or legal option. If you triggered that act, I think the courts would say it might be lawful to remove somebody to a safe country where their claim will be processed. But if you haven't got any such plan, for 95% of these people, probably 99% of these people, they're going to have to go into the UK asylum system. So that, that's what's been happening since, I think they've passed the law three times now to say we won't have these claims. But, 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 but unless you've got another plan, you will have to have these claims in the UK system. So in reality, you've got somewhere in the region, if I've got the sums right, sort of 77, 80,000 or so people who are currently in limbo with no possible possibility of claiming asylum. And there's a difference in principle between the two main political parties at this election, which is that Labour's policy is to assess the claims and the Conservative policy is to refuse the claims. But in practice, there probably isn't a difference in practice in principle, i.e. a government will have to unwillingly accept the claims. And the Conservatives have had their manifesto out this morning and it says um, we will implement our Illegal Immigration Act and bring that into force, and we will clear the backlog. And depending on who they mean by the backlog, they're either going to ban themselves from clearing the backlog, or it might be that they would clear the backlog and then introduce 
the duty, but there, there is a question for them to answer, which is that what is the plan for the 70,000 people? I'm coming to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a plan, and was Rwanda it? A plan for asylum in general, or for, to answer that Let's deal, with, the, deal with that group for the start with, and then we'll do No. As far as I can tell, there isn't, there isn't really a plan, because the government has fallen into a trap, as it has on an awful lot of issues where it is simultaneously refusing to own a very liberal regime. In fairness, because a lot of its voters don't want that regime. But on the other hand, it is not prepared to do any of the things required to, to make an alternative work. So we, every month, have more stories about hotels. We have ministers cracking down on hotels. But if you don't want to store people in hotels, you have to build a, an asylum estate to put them in. And that would involve asking the Treasury for money, putting something in a Tory MP seat. And so that doesn't happen. And so we get more hotel stories. And at the same time, they don't legislate aggressively enough to, to clear out the thicket of things that their policy keeps falling over. So Rwanda, I mean, the origin of Rwanda was it was a policy that would take a five-year parliament to deliver. It would be brought in much more in a much more gradiated fashion. Uh, that would give you time to iron out, as they saw it, all of the kinks. And then at the end of it, you would have a legal model, which you could then use as a template both for further deals with Rwanda and for maybe negotiations with other countries. Because you could say, look, we've, we've, we've ironed out all the kinks in this process. And instead, because Rishi Sunak became leader in 2022, he needed one thing to sort of buy off Suella Bravman and stop her running for the leadership. And so he went with like, the full fat version of Rwanda, which was never deliverable in, in two years. And so that's why we are where we are. So... If the Conservatives were to win the next election, are they going to carry on with the Rwanda scheme? Yeah, I mean, they couldn't, ab they couldn't abandon it now. I, I, it's sunk costs fallacy in a way. I think they've put far too much into it. There's certainly things they could do if they did manage to get a plane off the ground to make it maybe slightly more effective. Like, I think it's absolutely bizarre the way that they've chosen the, the people who are eligible as people who all arrive before a certain date. Because if you want it to be a deterrent, and it is supposed to be a deterrent, it should be the people are like now, right? It should be that, you know, because if you limited it to people who arrived in the last like month, two months, then all of a sudden you, someone thinking about getting on a boat, that's a lottery with much shorter odds of you getting selected. As it is, even if you've heard of the policy, you know for a fact that you're not eligible to be taken to Rwanda because they've got 6,000 people on the list from 2023. So, I mean, they, they could tweak it, but I think if there was somehow another sort of Sunak government, and this policy issue rumbled on, you would end up circling back towards sort of the ETHR, international law changes and so on. Because within the current framework of the UK's international legal obligations, you can't limit the system in the way that the many elements of the Conservative Party want to do. But in reality, the Conservatives were only ever thinking about, what, 500 or so people going to Rwanda. So if you're, if you're a gambling person, you'd think, my chance of being one of those 500 pretty slim? Yeah, of course. Right? I mean, but but the, again, the point is, in theory, if they can get Rwanda working, then one, they can negotiate with the Rwandans to take more people because they've already sunk in all those upfront costs. They've fought the legal battles. And two, they have a template and they can go to other countries and say, look, we've already hashed all this out with Rwanda. Here is a legal watertight deal. Here's the amount of money. Will you take a thousand people? A thousand are still a drop of the ocean compared to... Yeah, one thousand at a time. There's a lot of countries out there that... <laughs> <laughs> So, given that we're doing drops in the ocean, so that's, that's interesting. So, let's, let's now imagine, instead of there being a Conservative government, there might be a Labour government. What, if you were advising Labour, I realise it's not quite your background, but were you to be advising Labour, what would you advise them to do? On asylum? On asylum, generally. Well, I mean, obviously, they can drop the Rwanda scheme, and they can, based on their their political priorities, which will be slightly different to, to mine as a Conservative, they can clear the backlog mostly by just letting people in, right? Whenever anyone talks about clearing the backlog, there's a reason the backlog takes so long to clear, and it's because it's so hard to return people without the proper paperwork. So if you want to clear the backlog, then you just sort of stamp, rubber stamp, let people in. You can get the numbers down like that. That means that you can also reduce hotel use um, and various other sort of short-term effects like that. I think if they... If they wanted a kind of longer term way to take the heat out of it, I think there's probably a few things you could do which maybe wouldn't go down brilliantly with some, peop some of the people in this room, but would remove the most egregious cases that kind of get people worked up about asylum. So you could, you could do a, you know, you can do prisoner vote style carve outs from the ECHR without leaving it 
And so you could do things for repeat offenders, for example, to make it easier to deport them and, you know, without them being able to file ECHR claims and so on. And I think that if you did that the right way, it would affect a very small number of cases, but it would take 80% of the stories out of the Mail and the Express, and that would take a lot of heat out of the policy. Thank you. So I just want to come to you now, Michaeli. So we've been hearing, obviously, the Randa scheme was deeply controversial politically, but also legally because of um, the Supreme Court's decision. And the Supreme Court was pretty clear about the fact that Rwanda wasn't safe as it now stands. But there is a problem, isn't there, going, going forward? There's a problem for whichever government gets into power, which is how to handle this issue of num large numbers of people coming. Um, and so the question is, is the Geneva Convention itself, uh, Refugee Convention, fit for purpose? So I think the first thing I would like to say about that is we're not really talking about large numbers of people when we compare with some of our European neighbours. Um, so I think that we should probably put that into some perspective. Can you, can you maybe just give the audience some idea of the figures. How, how, what's the sort of levels of asylum applications in France and Germany? Oh my goodness, now you've really put me on the oh, spot, sorry. Catherine. I think, I, think, I think it's about 120 odd thousand, yeah. 140, for, for Germany. Yeah, so we're talking, so, so Randall's putting his thumb up in the air which says go higher, go higher. So we're talking about two to three times more people in those places yeah. than we're dealing with in the UK. Um, so I think we should be very, very clear on that. Um, in respect to the UN Convention on Human Rights, um, uh, sorry, the UN Refugee Convention, I think that, okay, so it's not perfect. We all know that, and there are many, many things that many of us in the room would like to change about it, but it is the best thing that we have got. And it does signal the UK's commitment to some kind of international protection regime. And yes, I think probably this government have been trying to shift the dial on that a little bit. But I think that that's kind of what our starting point should be, certainly for those of us who believe in human rights on some level. Right. Sunda, what do you think about your, the convention? I think, I think look, if Keir Starmer is the Prime Minister, as is very likely, he's going to be for multilateralism as a way to do this. But that multilateralism will include things like should we be thinking together about different systems, reforming conventions, and so on. I mean, let's face it, if you embarked on a process of treaty reform at the international level, you wouldn't complete it in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, although you might start to do things at a European level or other levels and, and so on. So that, that debate there. So, you know, in principle, for example, the, you know, the Labour Party will say, I mean, the, the current government won't say, everyone's copying our Rwanda scheme, but they're, they're thinking about different things. They're, they're, several people are thinking about externalities, offshoring, where, and, and so on, but it's different kinds of schemes. So those conversations will go on, but I think, I think that is a very long-term thing, and there'll be short-term pressures. Something that hasn't been noticed, I think, this election in July wasn't expected. It was thought to be October, November. That dramatically changes the short-term politics of asylum and immigration in different ways. For example, the Labour Party was very anxious about what it would do if a plane went, um, and the Prime Minister was planning to send a plane. But if, if planes had started, and then you'd had crossings in August and September, then the August and September crossings would have disproved the case for Rwanda as a deterrent, if it's not a deterrent. Now, the same crossings in August and September might be taken to be proof of what happens if you scrap the Rwanda scheme. They might increase the cost of doing that, even though they couldn't change that. On the other side of the ledger, um, overall net migration will look high in November. It will look very, very low by spring 2025 because of care changes and so on. And so Rishi Sunak has now cut immigration for Keir Starmer, not for himself. And so that, that might give them some breathing space on overall numbers, but some real pressure on, on asylum and channel crossings. They had three ideas about what to do about this. One was scrap the Rwanda scheme, it's a waste of money, it isn't working. Let's spend it on some other things, talk about border force and so on. Two was we have to process the claims. And so uh, a new government will be processing the claims willingly that the old government would have been processing unwillingly. And their third idea, which they've now gone quiet about, was to talk about the kinds of deals you might do, either with France or with several countries or with the EU as a whole. And a new government would absolutely bite the hand off President Macron if they were able to say, if we took a number with permits, authorizations to travel of the UK, maybe the number that are coming anyway, would you take back the people that came? 
And they might not get that deal with France, but they would have loved it. When they tried to talk about that, the Conservatives said, EU quota, Mr Starmer, rejoin, and so on. And so they've, they've decided not to talk about the logical third point of their plan, which is what would the multilateral thing look like. But what we don't know is if President Macron doesn't say, what a nice idea, Mr Starmer, of course we will do the deal that you want. What, what, kinds, of, what kinds of multilateral regrangers can you have? Because policing can do some things but policing doesn't give you the question of whose claim should be heard where. And what effect, I don't know whether you know the answers, if, if with the French elections and if the um, uh, right wing get in and, and Baldo becomes prime minister, well, presumably that will make it harder to do a deal with France. There's always domestic politics in other countries and there's always domestic politics in France about what, what is fair and what is, not, what is not fair. Therefore, any multilateral agreement that is deeper has to be sellable by the UK government to the UK public and by the French uh, uh, public as well. But that is, you know, so that, that aspect of what, what could happen, what should happen, it is definitely a Starmer idea that because the piece of water is so narrow that it's an international cooperation issue but they're really nervous about the politics of how they say that before an election and so we'll see whether they develop more of an agenda on it afterwards. If there was um a Labour government and the Labour do manage to negotiate some sort of deal with the French what effect do you think that would have on um, the Conservative supporting newspapers? Well, I mean, it, it would probably go down well as far as it goes. The, the great Starmer Le Pen pact to deal with the <laughs> cha <laughs> cha to deal with to, to deal with the Channel crossings. Um, I th ultimately, however, I think that the question is, unless you can get the problem down to a point where those frictional things which cause it to keep appearing in the right wing press stop. You know, the endless stories about guy commits horrible crime, can't be deported, whatever, all, all of that kind of thing. Then it will still be there because the incentive is still there to run it. And that's what keeps up the attritional stuff on. You know, most people don't object to an awful lot of the system, right? The, the Hong Kong system, everyone loves that. The Ukraine system, everyone loves that. You can sell most of it. But unless you tackle those bits that are driving the opposition, then eventually the right wing press will be like, that's very nice. But now, we're like, where's the next deal? Like, what else are you doing? But I think it would be interesting. In some ways, I think Starmer would feel it, uh, not Starmer, Sunak would feel it as a bit of a vindication because the Rwanda scheme wasn't his proposal. The Albania deal was, and the Albania deal is like one of the most standout effective parts of the government's illegal immigration strategy. So I think he'd be sitting there quietly being like, I wish I'd been able to sell my party on doing that. But does it mean, I mean, the, the, the Albanian deal's always held up as the big success story, but does it in fact mean that people who otherwise would have got asylum are now being deprived of that opportunity? Asylum in the UK. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely across the detail, but, but you know, potentially, but I think ultimately one of the big fundamental philosophical disputes at the heart of this, and this comes down, this touches on a lot of the debates about, you know, whenever we have the debate about safe and legal routes, for example, you know, why don't we allow in-country applications to British embassies all over the world, is that you need, at least if you're on the right and that you take that view of the, of the asylum system, you need some way of, ma of capping the number of people that you take and currently, the decision that we've decided to use is to have a sort of biathlon with several thousand miles of Eurasian hiking in the Dardanelles. <laughs> and that's the system we use to limit applications. And there are all kinds of downsides to that system, but if you wanted to move away from it, you would have to have other formal mechanisms of taking somebody with an eligible asylum claim and saying no. Because if you don't, you're never going to win consent for legal routes. Okay. Uh I mean, you touched from on the questions that have come in, and I do urge you to um, use Slido, the QR codes um, on the screen behind me. Um, is, you know, there is a basic question. I mean, the premise that we have started from implicitly in this conversation is that we have a responsibility to take asylum seekers. I mean, there is a question here to say, why? Why should we be taking any at all? What's the argument, Karen? So I think that the argument is, uh, I mean, it's one that even the Conservative government use themselves when they talk about the UK's world-leading track record on human rights and humanitarian issues. You know, we're talking about people who generally are 
not, not choosing to leave the places that they are, but forced to leave the places that they are because conditions there have meant that life is no longer livable for a variety of reasons, be that war and conflict, be it persecution on an individual level. And I think that generally the, the British public would, would want to be known for offering that sense of hospitality. Indeed, that's precisely the, um, the kind of logic that's guided the support for some of the other schemes. Um, so when we looked at Homes for Ukraine um, and things like that. So I, so I think there's a public appetite for that kind of humanitarian protection. Well, broadly speaking, I think, I think about three quarters of the public, for various reasons, think that a country like this one should be part of an international system like that, where people who need protection get it, and therefore we should do our bit. And then there might be some contingent points we should, you know, take a fair share, but, you know, not take an unfair share, and so on. And then there would be a section of the public that would say, actually, no, count me out. I would scrap all of the conventions and so on. But that wouldn't be a, that would be a difficult political thing. Now, in terms of then how you apply that in every era and so on, but, um, you know, the reason we have the international systems is in the 1930s when there was great need, there wasn't an international system. So we've got three quarters of a century almost now of, of saying there is an international system and therefore you, you're obliged to be under the rules of that. And each of those eras, certainly, you know, the Ugandan Asians um, and other groups, you know, it was contested politically. But there is, I think, a tradition of wanting to play, wanting this country to play its part, but and then to do it in a way that is managed and, you know, can you know, make it work domestically as well. We've been talking about Labour and the Conservatives, but what about reform, the insurgent party? Where do they stand on this really very difficult issue? I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. I mean, otherwise I'm just going to guess some, some mad stuff. So it's, it's tended to be the case um, for, say, somebody like Nigel Farage, who is, a, who is a sort of slightly more mainstream populist who is interested in his respectability credentials in politics. It's tended to be the case that he would say, oh, yes, you know, genuine systems or Ukraine and so on. But, but his vote would be split on that principle, might be in the tear up all of the treaties, might be in the, well, we should take some genuine people, but I bet most of them aren't genuine and so on. And so they have a very robust sort of position. I'm sure that they would, you know, have examples where they would do it. But so, you know, they would they would say that nobody who has been in Europe is an asylum seeker anymore. They might be an asylum seeker in Syria, but what about France? And so on. And so their actual policy, which has changed a bit at different times, but their policy is that we have a legal right to pick up boats in the channel and take them back to France and just put them back in France. And if you say that's a very novel reading of international law. We, we don't, in fact, have that, or very few people think that. Their position is, well, we should do it anyway and <laughs> see what happens. So it's a war with France might be, the, might be the policy in the end. But it's not particularly the case that a populist party saying, you know, you messed up, Mr Sunak, necessarily needs to have a workable plan. I mean, the deputy leader, Ben Habib, he once said that if you got the boats in the channel and took them directly to Rwanda, um, oh, but, uh, that, that would stop it. But he hadn't looked at a map of the landlord. Because their position now is that Rwanda was never going to work. It's just a gimmick. So in a sense, they agree with the left critics. But that but the Britain doesn't have to take any of these claims because you could just take them back to France and have a bit of a face-off Royal Navy versus the French. And, See what but, happens. I mean, as we know, the logistics of actually doing that, it's very easy to say we just take the boats back to France, but boat which has got 100 or so people on it or more. And you've got the responsibility to protect life. But also, obviously, the British armed services are not going to do things that are not in international law. So this is not, this is not a policy that a government that wanted to agree with. I mean, in the end, governing parties can never quite outbid populist parties on things to say on the radio. Well, I think there are a few other things Gone. in there as well, which... You know, I did have a very brief look at the Reform Manifesto this morning, and there's six points that are compressed into a space like this. Um, one of them is, is still to offshore people to the British overseas territories, um, but there's also a direct commitment to withdrawing from the ECHR. But I should say, as with the picking up people, picking up the boats and, and returning them to France, it's all intended to happen within the first 100 days of their administration. So we've got a, a set of unworkable points uh, in a very short period of time. So I think what you're pointing to there is partly the politics of 
of narrating it even in those terms. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what we also know is that there are criminal gangs, gangs of people who are facilitating the crossing. Um, it, what do you think Labour could do to deal with the, those criminal gangs? We're told that they're going to smash them, but what does that actually mean? How do you actually set about doing that? What, 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 smashing the gangs? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. I think the problem is that if, if, you, if you do it effectively, it's not it, it's just from a pol political angle. Yeah. If you do it effectively, it's quite boring um, because you're just sort of arresting people and they're usually being tried in other countries and you don't get any sort of spectacle or visuals. And because the demand is still there um, and dinghies are cheap, then another criminal gang will start furnishing dinghies um, pretty quickly. So, I, you know, I might be wrong, but as far as I can see, that while there are some international networks making sure that, you know, you, you buy your buy your ticket at the Dardanelles, then they'll maybe promise to get you across Europe whether they do or not. These aren't difficult things to replicate, you know, putting people in the back of trucks, furnishing them with boats that aren't fit for sea and hoping they get halfway across the channel and a British ship finds them. So maybe if you were to come up with a really dizzyingly, you know, deterrent criminal regime, you know, absolutely horrifying sanctions, public, public executions, um, and that kind of thing, then it might work. But as I see it, within the current law and order regime and the, you know, the, the current temperaments of the government, then there will always be more criminals prepared to step up and do more smuggling. I think I have a slightly, a, a kind of completely opposing um, <laughs> position on this, which is why don't we try to decriminalise migration more generally and decriminalise asylum and open up ways of people arriving in this country safely? And then we wouldn't need to have this conversation on repeat about criminal gangs because it would be, you know, it would be controlled. It would be controlled by the government. Um, but, you know, and I think that part of, what, part of what you've said there plays into exactly that kind of sensationalization of, you know, something that, again, people risking their lives, paying huge amounts of money to arrive in this country to be told that they have to go you somewhere need, else. You need, well, you, if you have safe and legal routes, you need to cap numbers. If you don't have a, if you don't have a way of capping numbers, then you'll never get political buy-in for safe and legal legal routes for, un, for a theoretically unlimited number so of people. Just come back on that because the current safe and legal routes for Ukraine and for Hong Kongers are completely uncapped. Right, but they're nationally specific, right? So if you move to having a universal asylum regime that was based that was on that basis, you would you would never win that battle, right? The, the Ukrainians and the Hong Kongers, they are specific cases that have lots of public buy-in, and with the best will in the world, there there's a, a limit to the number of people who could theoretically use them. You couldn't move the overall asylum system onto that basis. I think the, I think I think there is a, a really sharp political dilemma here, which is which is that because it, it is the visibility and the visibility of the lack of control, not the numbers. If you could regularise the flows you've got, you would massively reduce the political system. If you tried then to do that in a totally unlimited way and the numbers were very, very high, you would have a lot of political pressure about that. So an unlimited safe route would deal with the gangs, but would be a difficult political situation if you weren't in some situation where you could show that other countries were playing the same role you were. So if you were doing un unilateral uncapped safe routes, that would be different from sort of systems where, you know, people were either taking a fair share or putting money into the pot um, and so on. And so the, the, the safe route that tries to, in a way, undermine the market of the smugglers is a very good idea, but without either some policing or some other approach as to what happens to the people outside it. And if, if you split that up, if you had a quota of 50,000 a year and you said they were available monthly, and it's much, much better to wait for next month's quota because you get your decision taken in three months and you get into the system and so on. Whereas if you come, like, we will be compliant with international law, but you'll be at the back of the queue and there won't be decisions. So you could try to incentivise the safe route by making it available, making it there and still making it politically viable. But that is, I think, uh, the dilemma politically. But doesn't it also take us back to that conversation before about whether the UK wants to be in a multilateral system or whether it wants to be unilateral? And if it was in a multilateral system, where there were agreements across a set of countries or across a bloc, for example, the European Union, um, you know, you might be able to have a conversation like that. But at the moment, we are at that impasse. 
Which brings me to the question, it's sort of implicit in what you're saying. We were talking about how to stop the gangs, how and the, the gangs can replicate themselves very quickly. Is there a different way of tackling this problem on the audience has asked? Um, should we be thinking about, in fact, increasing the international development budget to mean that fewer people are actually forced to leave their home countries, or is this for the birds? I mean, it's not for the birds. The government, the government has done this. Um, it's the justification for large parts of the current international development budget. The idea is that the money can go an awful lot further, helping people in their country of origin, and you also help avoid the drain of people from countries that you know could really use those people. It's one of the sort of under underappreciate uh, under discussed aspects of international migration is that often you are taking the best and brightest from some of those countries. So that's why that was why we funded camps in Syria, for example. The idea was that the money would go a lot further. So it's not nothing. I think the problem is when you've got the, the sheer scale of the problem. Like are you realistically going to spend enough to stop there being a flow of people crossing Europe to try and come to this country? and creating demand for criminal smugglers. Like, I don't think you are. So spending international development in this way is good, and it's a good way of selling international development spending to migration skeptic voters, but it's not an either or. You're not, it's not an alternative to dealing with the problem of criminal organizations. Um, do you have anything, did you want to <coughs> add anything? No, I think um, in a way, I mean, international development can mean lots of different things and you know, better living standards across the world. I think, I think conflict resolution and support for countries, you know, of arrival, countries of origin, etc. That that is an important part of of the policy. In the end, there is then going to be a large group of people coming to advanced Western countries, you know, with valid claims for persecution under the law. And so you've got to either see where they end up or find some way to do sort of you know management of of where people go and who pays for that. All of this points to much greater cooperation with a very large neighbour, like, dare I say it, the EU, and where the numbers could be spread across a lot of member states rather than just talking in a binary way between the UK and France. Um, <coughs> given that uh, the Labour Party is not committed to rejoining the EU, let alone um, uh, taking more dramatic steps, so I suppose, what effect will the EU migration pact have, even though we're not part of it? Well, you know, that, that is also obviously contested within, within the EU. In terms of the post-Brexit relationship, you know, people are exhausted about the debate about, you know, rejoin and so on, and certain aspects of single markets and free movement might do that. In terms of sensible cooperation with countries in Europe, actually people's top of the list for the public across political tribes would be cooperation on security issues, terrorism issues, migration issues that different parts of the public might have very different ideas about a very liberal way to cooperate or a very securitized way to cooperate. But it wouldn't be difficult to sell the idea of cooperation for particular purposes as a separate point from the political relationship with the EU. The content of that and the negotiability of that and the domestic politics of that across different EU countries, obviously very, very different views within every country right now. Germany is an unusually polarised country. You know, Hungary, Poland will be opt well, Poland's got a, a new Liberal government. Hungary will be trying to veto and opt out of everything. So what is the thing that you would be cooperating with might take a long time to take shape? Do you agree? Do you think it's possible to have some sort of deal with the EU? Of course, assuming the EU actually wants it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't see why not. I think from the perspective, you know, from the perspective of Brexiteers, there were lots of reasons to leave the EU and for, for the kind that you're dealing with at the top of the Tory party, it was mostly about the overall constitutional order and Britain's you know, dem capacity for democratic self-determination. And so for them, actually, their kind of model for how they wanted our relationship with the EU to work was bilateral agreements where we needed them. That was always the point. There were obviously other Brexiteers for whom that was not the case, um, but they now have a party that's polling 13%. So. For the, for the Tories, at least, yeah, I think you can say, look, we've got a deal on security and migration. Uh, it's dealing with something that's concerning to the public. It's very defined. It's got very narrow terms. That is saleable. The question is, the separate question is whether or not it's negotiable and whether it's available. But I think if you could get a deal like that, then the Conservatives would support it. I'm keen to hear from the audience, for those of you who are not doing battle with um, Slido, but the Slido remains open <coughs> for anyone who does want to use it. And thank you uh, to the various questions that have come in there. Um, I will start, I'll have a 
question fr from the front, one at the back, and I'll, I'll come take this side as well. Okay, yeah, just start. Yeah. Um, just hold on one moment yeah, just while we get a, a microphone so that those <coughs> online can hear. Uh, I do have a question, but just the numbers, because it was brought up. Uh, 2023, Germany, 243,835 asylum applications. France, 156, 456. Italy, uh, almost 136,000. Uh, Little Austria, 109,000. And then the UK, uh, just under 80,000. Uh, my, my question is to you, Henry Hill, and it's a bit of a historical one. Um, <laughs> why, why did the Conservatives come up with a promise of reducing net migration to less than 10,000 and repeatedly doubled down on it? Net migration in the less than 100,000, right. in the, in yeah, the tens of thousands. Yeah. 10, yeah. yeah, less than 100,000, so in the tens of thousands. Um, why did they come up with that promise? <laughs> abundantly obvious, looking at the statistics, that would be impossible to achieve. Related questions, why, and this is for everyone, why is net migration always the measure, when by definition you can't control it, because if the um, you know, British economy changes, then the outflow of Britons will go up and down. And thirdly, why are students included when they are temporary migrants? And it seems to me in the, in the parties, there's a, a massive own goal uh, through definition, that could be very, very easily, very easily changed. Okay. I yeah, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to remember all three of them. So, students are included because they, while they're here, they do uh, in areas with high student populations contrib exact, contribute to things like the housing shortages, pressure on housing, and services, and so on. And they have visas that allow them to stay here. So. The party has never been sold on the idea of taking them out, especially when they're so when numbers are so high. They just think that's deceitful. The tens of thousands pledge. I mean, it was a bad policy. It wasn't a bad policy necessarily because of the goal. Um, I think you can be somebody who wants to bring down immigration and think that was a very bad way of going about it because the focus on the headline numbers doesn't deal with any of the structural factors driving this country's reliance on immigration. And I think a point that I always try to make to Tory ministers when I'm talking to them is, you know, fine, if you want to have a, a, a strategy for bringing down migration, that needs to be an all-of-government approach. It needs to look at um, education and skills and training. It needs to look at businesses. Um, it will involve a head-on confrontation with the CBI because you'll have to basically create conditions that force them to raise wages. Um, and there's all kinds of things. And they, they just don't want to do any of that. So you focus on numbers, and then you bring in a cap on numbers, and then you try and find random ways to, br to bring the numbers down, and that's how you often end up with, with ministers coming up with quite random restrictions that they've come up with, because that's what happens when you say to civil servants, we can't touch any of the big things. What could we do to bring numbers down? And they sort of look around, and they come up with spousal visas or whatever. Um, and that's what that policy is. What was the third? Why net? Why net? Oh, net, because, because it's, a, it's a perfectly fair measure, right? It's the, it's the number of people coming in. I think it's slightly process-brained. Um, to suggest that, you know, actually, if we, if we, if we stop Britons from leaving, then net immigration would be lower and it would be less of a problem. The, the, the focus is broadly, we have half a million or more people coming in every year and we build something in the region of 280,000 houses, right? It matters. And the outflow is a slightly wonkish, maybe it's not the best use of statistics in the purest sense, but in terms of the politics, it's perfectly adequate, I think. Thank you. Um, Sunda. It's an understandable mistake ahead of the 2010 election in opposition. The rationale is that before Tony Blair threw things open, this, is the, this was the previous level. Therefore, maybe this is the normal level. And um, either they tested it in a focus group or the focus group came up with it. But that, that is where it came from. The catastrophe for David Cameron is repeating it in 2015. And you haven't been able to drive it down because you're calling a referendum on the European Union and you're for the membership of the European Union. The membership of the European Union is another reason you definitely can't keep this pledge and you're going to have to explain that. So that, that, is, a, that is a big reason it, reason it, it went wrong for, for them. Um, but what's very interesting is, of course, they then get the control to meet it under the Johnson government and numbers go up a lot. And there's a real paradox, I think, of control. 
and the post-Brexit system, which is that in one way, especially the Leave sceptical group, they absolutely haven't got what they expected because they've got control and now the non-EU policies being released, they've got it much higher. In another aspect, on both asylum protection issues and on immigration choices, all of the choices made by the government are broadly the choices the public would themselves make because they would be very open to the NHS and social care visa. They actually think the short-term agriculture makes sense because the fruit needs picking and so on. And so, and so they would make exactly the choices the government have made and then not be happy with the number it adds, adds up to. And yet, and yet you know, public opinion has softened a lot on the left of the spectrum, but on the right of the spectrum, you've got, you've got a, a, a group of about a third who I call the sincere reducers. They would like to reduce migration and they are prepared to cut good immigration to do it because less students is okay to cut immigration. But there's another group who are really controllers and selectors who in the end would select all of the immigration we've got. And this was also the case, you know, if you know, people thought it should come down, but of course we've got to do something for the Ukrainians and the Hong Kongers are our responsibility and so on. So, so actually the, the post-Brexit system makes exactly the choices the public would make. The numbers are different to the numbers they're expecting. So they might, it might make the, the choices that the public might expect in terms of, you know, who's allowed to come. But do you think it's the choices that the public would have chosen in respect to the kinds of the running down of rights of those people in, and also um, some of the issues around, so we know, for example, people coming through health and social care visas might be on lower salaries than other members of the workforce. Similarly, the agricultural visa, the terms of that are absolutely horrendous. And that, that is a problem with temporary issues. I mean, the public have no idea about this level of detail if they don't either work in HR or, you know, people then have family experience with family rules um, or something. But, the public were very, very strong on the idea of protecting the rights of the people who were already here and that the new rules would apply to new people because it was, like, while that was a shock to the people who were here and what it might mean, I think it was a sincere point from the public that changing the future rules wasn't about changing the rights of the existing group. The government was then very, very slow to do that, but it wasn't for lack of public consent. I mean, the public support for that was literally the day after the referendum, it was 86% wanted immediate guarantees of the rights of people already here. Thank you. The gentleman there in the like, Isn't one of the realities that you, you can't stop irregular migration, and but yet no one has the political courage, maybe understandably, to say so. You can't sort of say, well, we're, we're completely defenceless against this. But, but while you can have boutique deals with allied countries like, like Albania, unless you're going to start signing return agreements and normalizing the Assad regime, the Taliban, the Eritrean government, and so on, um, there's a significant portion of people that will, will never be able to go back home, as it were. And then neither will they will be able to stay in transit countries. Because just to finish, in 2015, when there was the European refugee crisis, a lot of those people that were on the move had already been displaced in other countries too. So purely just moving the pieces around doesn't really appear to work. So I'm wondering, do you think that Labour, clean slate, huge majority, do you think there's a chance they might get a bit more honest with the public, introduce ideas of managing and making orderly uh, the way that people arrive here anyway? So. You can't stop irregular migration, <coughs> so you may as well deal with it, and the politicians have got to be brave and face up to the, tell the truth to the public. Um, I think there is probably nothing that would do more to hasten the return of the Conservative Party as a viable party of government than Sir Keir Starmer having a mask-off moment on July 5th and going, actually, there's nothing we can do about illegal migration, guys. Um, we're just going to let everyone in. Um, it, you know, overnight, 10 points. So, no, it, there's a reason that politicians don't, don't do this, right? Which is that the way that you framed your question, you said there's nothing you can do about it, but actually there's nothing you can do about it unless you start chipping away at certain legal uh, in, international agreements, certain sort of principle debate uh, arguments, foundations that we've had for the, for the asylum system. And politicians, especially the ones that deal with immigration policy a lot, they know, I think, or they suspect, I think correctly, that if ever you really started positing it as a choice between either we have to publicly admit that we can't control our borders or we have to reform the ECHR or the Refugee Convention, the public would go for option B, right? So, no, there's a reason that politicians keep 
stringing along on this. There's a reason that they keep trying to do what they can. It's not perfect by any means, but we don't live in you know, Plato's Republic or whatever. It's probably better than an alternative where a very brave government decided to try and sell the British people on the idea that you just couldn't stop people coming here and then s see what happened. Go on. Yeah, but I was going to come in on that, but because we also know from the other side of this that just because an option is there for people to move somewhere doesn't mean that they can move somewhere. And we know that in a lot of cases, when we're talking about people fleeing persecution or displaced, they're displaced internally within the countries that they live in or regionally because they do not have the resource in the first place to get to one of those richer countries. So in some ways, there is already a limit on who would come anyway. I don't think we'd suddenly start to see massively inflated numbers coming through that way. So it is, I mean, it, it, does, it does kind of suggest that, you know, you open the doors and suddenly all of those other obstacles to people moving are removed. Well, I, I mean, as I said earlier, we use, we use geographical distance as our current de facto filtering system, but you would, you would have a theoretically unlimited cap, which would be a problem just politically anyway, like regardless of it. But also I think that part of the reason that we've got into these problems in all kinds of areas is that we've drawn up international agreements and, and domestic legislation that was very complacent about the status quo at the time that they were written and has proven ill-suited to adapting. So... Again, I don't think you'd be much less brave than the first version of Sir Keir Starmer if you were the Keir Starmer that ended that speech with, but, but most countries are quite far away, so, you know, um, it'll probably be fine. I think it is absolutely the case that if you want a liberal system and you want sustained consent of it, then being in the framework of the manageability of what we're going to do about our responsibilities is much better than being in the framework of the unmanageability and the uncontrollability of the chaos of the world, because that, that, will, that will frighten people and so on. So, so manageability is very important. Now, manageability can involve acknowledging there are no perfect deterrents that will ever stop everything, but you have to show. So you know, the, a Labour government, if elected, cannot control the crossings in August very quickly, or they can start to talk about what they can do about it. They can control the costs of accommodation and hotels, but if they get a system back up, they start processing claims, they show that it can work, they can move it. You know, Starm is caught between two things. He believes in a rule-based system um, on principle, and he's answering this question of what is a deterrent. So he ends up saying, well, if you process the claims, you can also return some people whose claims fail. So, for example, 7% of claims from India are accepted, but if we don't uh, process any of those alongside the 99% of claims from Afghanistan that will be accepted, then we don't do the acceptances of the 99%, but we don't do any of the returns either. Um, they can have voluntary return schemes outside of government, run by faith groups, etc., that would be a humane and practical way to make offers to people so they could leave, because enforced returns are always going to be very, very expensive for governments and not operating. So ways to demonstrate more manageability and have more visibility of the manageability, even though, in the end, no government has ever got total control of everything. OK, thank you. So, gentlemen, there, brief question. I've got a couple of uh, uh, women over here. So you go first, then the gentleman here, but if you could be brief. It's just a question in two parts. Um, there's a bipartisan consensus that says that we must smash the criminal gangs. What is the evidence that criminal gangs actually exist? Anybody who represents asylum seekers regularly will listen to the, their narrative account of how they left the country in which they were persecuted and will know that it's friends and family that facilitate their exit from those countries. And the only point at which they encounter criminal gangs is at the last leg of the journey across the channel. So there is no upstream to... Uh, and the, the second part of my question is that the Home Office's answer was pre-registration. That's what we did with BNO migrants. We allowed them to make initial claims for further leave to remain on human rights grounds outside the immigration rules and regularise themselves online with an application. That, that way, uh, taking it out of the hands of the criminal gangs. So my question is, what is the evidence that the problem exists in the form in which politicians are purporting to describe it? Okay, thank you. So, do you, Sunder, do you want to answer that, any of that? Well, I mean, as you say, the, 
the gangs do exist on the visible bit of the last leg of the journey, which is the bit that people are worried about. And that might not, you know, without the gangs, lots of people might be making journeys. I think, I think if you can, as with my manageability point, if you can find regularised flows that take away the market in ways that have political consent in a democracy, you will take away the gang's market in a different way from smashing them. But, but you know, there's no doubt at all that the, you know, in the end, people are making payments to traffickers at, at, at the end point, and therefore, you know, it's not surprising. I mean, in a way, there's a subtlety, I suppose, in what the Labour Party is trying to do, is they're trying to put more emphasis on criminalising the gangs, not the asylum seekers, but that's, that's obviously quite a fuzzy line, but it's slightly helpful, you know, um, thing to try and think through. Do you, do you want something on criminal gangs? Do they exist? Um, well, I mean, they clearly do at one end of the process, right? Like, I'm not an expert on the, that detailed side of the policy, but I already think that dealing with the gangs is probably not going to be a solution. So. Okay, thank you. Go on. Um, is it a time to actually stop humanitarian ones, but allow in, like, asylum? In the, the reason why is that you're saying, like, having no real restriction on the numbers that actually come, allow, allow anyone that applies to come here. Now, climate change, like I was saying, in even southern EU, uh, m people with even wealthy money might want to come to the UK because they speak English as a second language. And if, if for the climate change, even across the EU, stopping EU citizens coming to the UK, I mean, climate change is a humanitarian need, isn't it, to move. So I'm worried that Keir Starmer, in his agreement with the EU over what is asylum and humanitarian reasons allowing people to come to the UK, he could accidentally include in that the ability for those escaping within the EU from the southern Europe to come to the UK. Thank you. Just hold on to that question so I can just accommodate uh, the two other questions over here. Thank you. Do you think that the people who are arriving by boats have already explored the legal route to get here? Thank you. Um, and the lady in front of you? I wanted to ask whether integration, a coherent and more assertive integration policy, isn't part of an effective and manageable uh, asylum system and why uh, successive Labour and Conservative governments have been kind of so uh, lackadaisical and asleep uh, on our integration. OK, thank you. Do you want to start with the last question? I imagine you want to, you've got views on that. Yeah, I mean, so I suppose the biggest barrier to politicians trying to come up with an integration strategy is, like, into what, right? Like, if I were to set a French integration strategy, and I'm not saying this is an amazing thing about the French Republic, but, like, I'd have a very, like, definitive list of the things that I would expect people to do. And in this country, we have, at least in recent decades, taken a very kind of liberal, I suppose you would call it, approach to, to what is British identity. P M MPs and ministers, they talk a lot about British values. But if you look at those British values, there's really nothing in those values that would distinguish a Briton from a French person or a German or any other kind of modern, progressive Western citizen. So when you want to assimilate, or not assimilate, integrate somebody into Britain, I think the problem is that you don't have much there in terms of a canon that you can integrate people into. Like some of my friends are sitting the citizen life in the UK test at the moment, and they'll ask me random questions about British history, and I, I don't know. And I, and I know quite a lot about British history. So I like the subject, but they're being asked stuff that I don't know. If there was a canon that we learned at school where everyone knew ex poets, ex history, whatever, then you could make other people learn that, and that would create a point of common connection. But we simply don't have the points there that you could build an integration uh, system around at the moment. There's just some very nebulous stuff about like being a nice person and speaking English, which isn't enough. Thank you. Nice person? Um, um, my, my contribution to the chapter is about why integration matters, and in the end, how people become us its possibility and its practicality is, is what fundamentally gives you confidence in immigration beyond all the practical things. And my book, How to Be a Patriot, actually tries to answer <laughs> Henry's questions. So you can get that. But there's a common sense view in this country. And we're not, you know, we're not France um, with their flags on the town halls and their terrible record on integration. But we are Britain with our better record on integration, despite all the fuzziness. People think, almost everybody thinks that a shared language is really, really important. If you don't have that, you'll never have the passport to 
economic opportunity, civic contact, etc. People think that mixed schools are better than segregated schools, and it'd be better to mix them up, have contact between them, um, and so on. There's a view that we should disagree well when we disagree with each other, but that's hard. That's hard to do, and it matters, I think, on refugee integration in particular, which is if you can catalyse early the contact of refugees with the communities they join, involve more people in that. It might be there are formal English language classes, which would be good, and there are conversation clubs as well. And so people who want to be on that side of the argument get to do things. It's good for the life chances of refugees, and it's, and it's really good for the confidence of the communities they join. So you can, you can do that. Citizenship ceremonies, I mean, we brought together um, naturalised Britons and British-born citizens, and the British-born citizens were really glad the naturalised citizens were there to answer all the history questions because they'd read <laughs> the book. But they were also persuaded, they were persuaded by the migrant citizens that actually people wanted to know what it was you were meant to know. It'd be better if they did ask, you know, sensible questions, not mad questions, and that there was a point to the process of doing it. Did you want to say anything about climate? Um, no, I think, um, I mean, I think, it, I think it's complicated and, you know, humanitarian protection is its particular thing. On the whole, historically, flows of migration between countries of similar economic levels have tended not to be that politically contentious because they might be a bit balanced over time, etc. And then, and then there is political contention when there are large one-way one way flows and you can make cases in different ways as to how to make that Shit, how to no, make that amazing. work uh, it's it's pretty it's unlikely it's pretty unlikely that 20 million spanish people are going to live oh, in britain oh, like, in just quickly like on the struct the structural the structural design point that for that is really you just want to avoid you want to make sure that the terms of the agreement are agreed between governments and aren't subject to court judgments because i think that the if you had a set text that was then locked in a lot of the problems that have arisen in the system is we've got legislation that was written in the 50s and over time courts have said actually this solemn binding treaty means this now um, and you want to i think just as a matter of democratic hygiene maintain strong active intergovernmental negotiation for the boundaries of treaties yeah precisely precisely and a, but, but a democratic citizen who will not be so take second Before we go off down that highway, Michaela, what yeah, would you... I just you want to come in off the back of your points around, um, around integration and Jill's question there. Because, of course, one of the big challenges around all of this is the fact that we've had degrading infrastructure to even welcome people into this country in the first place. And that's everything from languages, language provision, through to, through to you know, I don't know, like getting children into school, showing them how to use the services that are available here. And that there has been disinvestment over a long period of time, which presents a significant barrier then for people who are arriving here. And the contrast when we look at the, and, and I know that British Future have written a report about this too, about the Welcoming Committee for the Hong Kongers, is that it was a model in some ways of what could happen if you actually put adequate resource into supporting people when they arrive in this country. Um, and I don't know how many of you know the details of that, but very broadly, the UK government provided some ring-fenced money to support the Hong Kongers to get into housing, um, to get their children into schools, to do all of these things. And I think that that's something that's worth reflecting on a little bit, that kind of infrastructure that's there. Why it matters is in 75 years of migration, we've done quite well at integration 10 years later and a generation later, and this was the first time that we had an active plan as people were arriving to actually help navigate both sides of it. Of course, we haven't just dealt with the lady's question over there about um, legal routes. Does anyone know whether... Well, most people won't have a legal route, and so there is no legal route to explore if you're not one of the groups one of the groups that are there. So I think this becomes the question, what should the legal route be? But if you are not a Ukrainian or a Hong Konger then, and you haven't already got here, then you can't apply without permission to come and apply to get here. So you could, if you're, in general, if you're an Afghan national who w w aren't in that very narrow group, you, there's no legal way of getting to the UK unless you're highly skilled. Yeah. And you know, it might be that you know, if you're a student, you're here and you had an asylum claim, then you can make an asylum claim. But most people with a persecution claim who aren't here don't have a legal route to come. I'm conscious that our time is up. I'm right. I want to say a huge thanks to my excellent panel. Thank you for the wonderful questions and thank you for keeping on.